All right, in this particular video, I want to spend some time highlighting some of the main points about the integumentary system, talking about the, uh, you know, I'll, I'll first start talking about the various functions of skin, and then we'll break down the various parts of skin and how they play roles in all these uh, functions. So, um, I don't know, on that note, let's uh, get going. So first off, the functions of skin are, there's quite a few functions of skin, more than, I mean, I remember being a student and, and, and learning all these, I was quite surprised uh, by just how many there actually are. Um, now, when it comes to the primary, out of all these functions, I would say, you know, one of them is definitely more of a primary function, um, and that would definitely be the physical barrier. I would definitely say this would be the number one function of skin right here. Um, now, Let's break this down. You know, so skin is a physical barrier. So a physical barrier against what? You know, I mean, what what is skin exactly protecting us from? And essentially, I like to break this down into two different categories. One, protecting us from pathogens. You know, basically agents that can get into our body and cause us to become sick or ill. Um, you know, like for example, bacteria. All right. Um, and another major barrier is, uh, against water. Now let's, now let's focus on this here for a second. Okay. Now notice I put that skin retards water loss. You know, when I say the word retard, that means to hinder. All right. Now I see this in students once in a while, um, it's just a kind of a classic mistake that students like to make when thinking about skin as a barrier is that skin does not prevent water loss. It hinders it. Okay, it's, you know, with the help of the nervous system, we can control how much water is lost um, out of the skin. And you guys should already, you know, you're probably already thinking sweat. All right. So, you know, and, and that's important because that kind of leads into the next part, you know, uh, and temperature regulation. All right. You know, we need... To, me, to regulate our body temperature. Our body temperature, like all other aspects of our physiology, is a very dynamic aspect of our, of our well-being, you know, meaning it's constantly going up and down, changing all the time. All right? And when we get too hot, we need to sweat. All right? When we get hot, we need to sweat. And by excreting that water out of the sweat glands, you know, that carries heat out with it. Um, and, you know, as long as that water evaporates off of our skin and, or gets off of our body somehow, all right, you know, that's a very good way to lose water. But, you know, when you're cool, you don't lose water. So, basically, you know, with the help of the nervous system, the skin can control water loss, okay? And as we break down the layers of the skin and talk about the epidermis, we'll talk about how the skin actually um, hinders this water loss or basically, you know, creates a waterproof barrier to prevent it from uh, exiting when we don't want it to, okay? But bear in mind that the skin can excrete water, okay, via sweat. So, you know, think of this word, you know, retard or hinder, all right? when it comes to water loss. Now, keeping this in mind, you know, this num this major function right here, so, th so this should already get you thinking then, you know, about what happens when there are problems with the skin. For example, something as simple as a cut. All right. If you cut your skin, so let's say here, skin, boom, now you created a cut. Now, all of a sudden, you just open the door for bacteria to invade in. Okay. You, I mean, has anyone in here ever gotten a second degree burn and noticed you develop a blister as a result? All right, that's, you know, because you're, you know, as you heal the skin, there's going to be some water accumulating in here, you know, that normally would be held in. All right, and think about this, probably one of the more common and examples is to think about a third degree burn. Okay, third degree burn. So, you know, it, it, when a person has a third degree burn, the, the, the big danger with a third degree burn is, you know, the, you know, you know how a third degree burn works when the burn goes all, you know, through all layers of the skin, all right? And then basically the inside of the body is completely exposed to the outside world. You just, again, open the floodgates for bacteria and you're losing a lot of water. So the two biggest parts of patient or the two most critical parts of patient care with patients who have third degree burns are essentially, you know, water regulation and infection control. 
you know, people who have third degree burns are pumped full of antibiotics, you know, broad spectrum type antibiotics to make sure that they're not going to get infections because if they're, you know, if those, if those uh, wounds aren't well taken care of, they're going to die of, you know, dehydration or infection, just whichever one comes first. All right. So that's something to keep in mind. So I would say this is the number one primary function of skin. It's a physical barrier. All right. And then again, we already hit on the temperature regulation. You know, we neurologically regulate temperature. Um, you know, we can cool ourselves you know, by eliminating water and heat will go with it. Cutaneous sensation. Now, a little, little uh, introduction to some new terminology. Okay, whenever you see the word cutaneous, you should automatically think skin. Okay, it's one of those, um, you know, cutaneous is one of those membrane terms. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Whenever you see the word cutaneous, just automatically jump to skin. All right. Now, what we're saying here with cutaneous sensation is that there are sensory receptors within the skin, you know, sensory receptors, um, you know, for touch, you know, heat, you know, or I should just, I should actually put temperature or, um, you know, pain, which is essentially extreme heat or extreme touch or touch meaning, you know, pressure. All right. Then I have a... I have a video out there called um, basically breaking down receptors. Um, I think it's called the overview of receptors, sensory receptors, that goes more in depth with the with the types of receptors that are found in the skin and, and the classes of receptors. But in the end, you know, a lot of these sensations, you know, these somatosensory sensations, um, like touch and temperature, come from the skin itself. And there are various, as I mentioned, receptors that are you know, which are just nervous specialized nervous system structures. Uh, specialized ends of neurons that are sensitive to changes in pressure and temperature. And then we send impulses to the brain about um, changes in those temperatures and, and, uh, and pressure so we can, you know, do what we need to do about them. All right. Metabolic, you know, basically I wouldn't say that the skin is a, you know, a, a humongous contributor to overall metabolism, but when we say metabolic, some of the important functions, you know, I'd say probably the most important metabolic function is vitamin D synthesis. All right. The beginning of the production of vitamin D takes place within the skin. We've got a, a, a pro-hormone or what's called a precursor to um the, the, the end product of vitamin D called calcitriol within the skin, and essentially this comes as a result of sunlight. So ultraviolet light hits the skin. The energy from that light changes the molecular makeup of this particular molecule, and then that's the beginning of putting it through a step-by-step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step -by -step process of the body converting it into the hormonally active form of vitamin D, and we need to use this in order to make sure that we can, you know, maintain calcium homeostasis. This allows us, you know, increases our ability to absorb calcium in the GI tract, all right? And that's why people who don't get enough sunlight, um, you know, become vitamin D deficient, and this can be particularly bad if you're a child and, um, you know, you don't get enough calcium in your system, or if you're vitamin D deficient or all the above, your bones aren't going to grow and develop properly. And you can develop conditions like rickets and soft bones and so on. Okay. Um, so that would be probably the main metabolic function uh, of skin. Now, as a blood reservoir, um, they basically, they're, you know, the skin, it, the skin can hold up to about 5%. You know, it's a skin that, you know, you know is the largest organ of the human body. And, you know, it can hold up to about 5% of the total blood volume, which is a decent amount if you consider how blood is spread proportionally throughout the rest of the body. So the nice thing about this then, if we, for example, if we're in need of, uh, if we're exercising, okay, and we need to increase the blood flow to our muscles, neurologically we'll constrict the blood vessels to our, you know, into, the, into our skin, which will increase cardiac output or blood flow to our working muscles. Because, I, mean, you know, I mean, up to about 80 percent of overall blood flow can be going to the muscles and exercise alone okay so that's a nice thing about skin in terms of a blood reservoir and then excretion there are just some metabolic waste that can be excreted in sweat okay you know and you know, so this is similar metabolic waste they're going to be excreted from the kidneys basically leftover products of protein metabolism you know those um you know those those ammonia those uh ammonia-based type waste that the, that the kidneys excrete. So, um, or, you know, leftover, you know, broken down steroid hormones and so on. 
uh, or hormones in general, I should say. All right, so the skin does play a little bit, or or sometimes excessive electrolytes are or are, are going to be excreted out. You know, have you ever seen that salt build up on your skin? Um, you know, while you're exercising, that's you know that's uh, that sodium that was in your uh, plasma that was essentially excreted out. So in a nutshell, these are the major functions of skin, but always keep in the back of your mind that this is going to be the number one function, the physical barrier. And then, you know, again, to, um, you know, keep pathogens from getting in and to basically control the amount of water that is being left out. And actually, I, I do want to mention this real quick. Uh, sorry, some of this. That skin can also uh, play a role in immunity. Okay, we have a lot of bacteria living on the surface of our skin, okay? And these bacteria are good. We have a what's called a symbiotic relationship with them. Okay, symbiotic relationship with them. You know, our skin is a nice little home for them. They get to hang out. And then as a result, you know, being that these, um, you know, symbiotic meaning like a partnership, okay? And as a result of these bacteria being on our skin, um, what they do is, you know, they're metabolically active, they're living organisms, they produce a lot of metabolic wastes, okay, and they excrete those wastes on the surface of your skin, all right, and then what happens is those wastes accumulate on your skin, and that makes, the, that, that creates a fairly low pH, the skin has a pH of around, you know, four to five, it's a, it's a fairly acidic organ, and that's good because these bacteria can thrive and survive, but there are lots of other organisms where this pH is just too harmful or hazardous for them to survive on. All right, so bear in mind that those bacteria on your skin are good for you, and those bacteria are what we would call, they're part of our, they're part of our normal flora. Okay, flora, meaning the bacteria that live on or within us. All right, and, you know, this leads me to a topic that I like to talk about sometimes is, you know, after the uh, H1N1 hoopla by the media a couple of years ago, uh, I noticed that I, I wish I would have bought stock in waterless soap uh, because the sales for that just skyrocketed. And, you know, you see, I, I don't know, you guys, you guys probably know somebody, if you are one of these people yourself, uh, hopefully this will help you, but... Um, they're just, it's important to have clean hands, especially working in medicine, you're working with patients, you need to clean your hands, wash your hands. But I do believe that there are plenty of people out there that just do this, just go in excess. You know, there are some people that every time they touch a doorknob or the wind changes directions, they need to be pirelling themselves and you can smell it a mile away. And then these people are always sick, they may get skin irritations because if you overwash your skin, you know, I mean, or, you know, kill too many of these bacteria, that could be detrimental because you could open the door for organisms that don't normally thrive on our skin, like fungus especially, to start developing on the skin and that's bad. I know there was an outbreak in the 60s or 70s, I can't remember when, of uh, there were some nurses stealing a really good surgical soap from hospitals and they were using it to wash their hands and then, uh, you know, and they were bringing it home for the kids to wash their hands and there was all these goofy skin outbreaks because the soap worked very well, but it wasn't for the purpose of everyday use. It was for surgeons or people who were in the operating room, the OR, to make sure their hands were clean so their patients didn't die of sepsis or infection. So bear in mind, it's important to wash your hands and keep them clean, but I think nowadays people go a little too crazy with this and like I said, it, there's just no need to be walking around with a bottle of Perel hand soap in your pocket or purse or wherever the heck you, you, you carry it around with. I mean, just, I don't know, just don't go Purell crazy, please, or waterless soap. I mean, Purell is not the only brand, it's just the only one I can think of. So, all right. So on that note, sorry, on that, after that tangent. So let's uh, talk about the layers of skin. The skin consists of three major you know, histologically unique layers and, you know, the, you know, the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis. Um, now, these layers of the skin, you know, epi, now pay attention to the terminology here, epi, okay, epi uh, above, okay, hypo, low, all right, dermis. Now, this truly is the skin itself. 
okay, the dermis itself. Now, so the epidermis is the upper, outer portion of the skin. The dermis is the middle portion of the skin. And then the hypodermis is essentially the deepest part of the skin. All right. Now, the epidermis is essentially what creates the physical barrier. All right. The dermis is basically made out of a lot of loose, you know, connective tissue proper where a lot of glands, hairs, I'll show you a picture of this in a second, glands, hairs, blood vessels, and so on, and nerves can form networks and find a home within the skin. And then the hypodermis, basically what it is, it's what, we, it's, it's what we'll call subcutaneous fat or sub-Q. All right, you know, subcutaneous fat. Okay, so technically it's not really a layer of skin, but it's more or less in between the skin and muscles that are within the body. All right, and then what, I, what I'm going to do next over the next few slides is talk about these major layers of the skin. So here we can, uh, if we take a look at this image, you can see the various layers of skin right here. You can see the epidermis. All right, you can see the dermis, and you can also see that the dermis, again, is by far the thickest portion of the skin. And then down here, you can see the um, hypodermis or the subcutaneous fat. So now, now, so again, as we mentioned here, that the epidermis is a, a bunch of layers of, of very metabolically active cells that wind up dying and get pushed towards the surface. And we'll talk about this process more in depth in a second. And then those dead cells on the upper surface are what create the barriers that we just discussed earlier. All right. And then what can happen is that there are some areas of the skin where the epidermis, you'll see these involutions that will be created by the epidermis. And then some of these involutions become active, okay, and form glands, you know, the sweat glands or the oil glands of the skin. And, you know, you remember from histology, we talked a little bit about, you know, exocrine glands and, you know, and how they were formed. But, you know, that's what they are, is that they're just inward folds of the epidermis around hair cells. And some of them form, you know, just tubes that open right up to the surface, as you can see these little pores here of the epidermis and excrete, you know, water and other material that's in there. All right. And then when you take a look in the dermis, you can see, now notice how the blood vessels get thinner as you work your way up the epidermis. All right. And then they, then you can form these capillary like loops. Okay. That, that supply the epidermis with blood that supply hairs with blood. That's a, you know, all these glands and these, these nerve, you know, this would be, these would be examples of sensory receptors. Okay. This is what's called a pylorectal muscle. We'll talk about that in a little while. Um, and so on. So basically these vessels branch out to supply all these specialized structures within the dermis with the, with the fuel that they need. All right. And then again, this height, this, um, hypodermis is just subcutaneous fat, which is primarily used for energy storage and cushioning. Okay. And then you'll notice that there are some large blood vessels in here. And those of you who are going into nursing or medical assisting, um, uh, or, you know, becoming a, you know, a doctor, you're going to have to learn how to give subcutaneous injections. You're going to have to practice the right depth and, you know, and how far in should the needle go. And then the needle goes into this fat and then you release the injection, you know, bigger blood vessels, you know, you got the fat down here. Okay. And so if you're, you know, if you're looking at a patient chart and you're ordered to give a sub Q injection, that's what they're saying. The needle's going in down to this deepest layer of the skin, down to this fat and the injection is given there. Okay, so these are the layers of skin, and now let's break down the layers individually. All right, so the epidermis, you know, remember, so by now you've already been through the, uh, the, the histology aspect of anatomy and physiology, and you know that the epidermis is comprised of stratified squamous keratinized epithelial tissue. Remember, just a brief review of your terminology, stratified means, you know, two or more layers of cells. Squamous, you know that squamous cells are just these small, flat-looking cells. And then keratinized, basically, you know, if you take a look at this upper portion right here, this is the keratinized aspect of, the, of, of this tissue. Keratin is essentially a protein that accumulates in these cells as they go through particular changes as they migrate their way up 
through the various layers of the epidermis. And then essentially when these cells are packed with keratin, these cells are dead. All right. And then that's, you know, part, a big part of forming, you know, our physical barrier. All right, so you know this, so by now you know that's, that the epidermis is comprised of this particular tissue. All right, and then here you can see, you know, a, a histological perspective of all the layers of the skin. You can see the epidermis again. You can see the dermis and how thick it really is, and then the thin little hypodermis down below. You know, you, can, you, you know what this tissue is. You know what adipocytes look like. These would be some blood vessels. All right, and then notice how the dermis, now the, the dermis looks deceptively small in this image because the dermis can create these upward folds into the ep epidermis, all right, and create these ridges or papillae up in, in here, you know, and these are essentially would be considered, you know, like fingerprints in, this, in, the, uh, in, the, in the fingers and toes, for example, okay? So the dermis is a lot bigger than what this picture is actually showing as a result of this. You know, this is just, you know, storing a larger tissue in a smaller space by, by organizing it this way. All right, so I like this picture, and again, you can see the URL to go check this out. You know, I've said this before, if you watch the histology videos, you know, go to this website and look at this. If you're really trying to practice histology and get to know this, whether you're a student in A&P, whether you're a student who wants to go into pathology or specifically with histology, this is a great website to really get some good exposure to some histology images. Okay. All right, so now let's break down the epidermis, okay? The epidermis essentially is made up of a few different type of cells, but the most abundant cell that you're going to find within the epidermis is called a keratinocyte, okay? Those are squamous cells that we just talked about earlier, all right? Now, when we want to talk about the life cycle of a keratinocyte, okay, essentially... What you need to start thinking about, I want to bump back to this picture here for a second. Um, oops. Okay, wait, what we need to be thinking here is that the epidermis is organized into various layers that we call strata. Okay, strata. All right, so basically within these layers, there are layers that are very close to, now, remember, this is an epithelial tissue. Remember, every epithelial tissue has a basement membrane. Okay? And the basement membrane, remember, is important because epithelial cells are so densely packed together, there's really no direct blood supply into the tissue. So, remember, this is a gel-like membrane that has you know, areolar connective tissue underneath it, and within that areolar connective tissue, there are blood vessels that, su that supply the, un the um, overlying cells with, you know, the oxygen and, nu and nutrients that they need. Okay, so this is a means of diffusion of nutrients into this particular tissue. All right, the most metabolically active, you know, the most metabolic activity is taking place down in the, in the lower strata, or what we call the stratum basale, of the epidermis, all right? And, you know, as I mentioned before, those keratinocytes are the most abundant type cell that you're going to find within the epidermis. And they're very, meta they're very uh, <laughs> metabolically active or mitotically active, meaning they divide a lot, okay? So as the new cells divide, the old cells are going to get pushed up away from that basement membrane. And then essentially, and you can do the math here, as the older cells are getting pushed up, they're getting pushed farther away from their life source. And as a result, they're going to be drained of their nutrients, they're going to be drained of their oxygen, and they're going to slowly start to die. And then, you know, if you're looking at it from a histology perspective, you can see the physical or morphologic changes that occur within these keratinocytes as they get pushed farther and farther away from their, from their nutrients from their source of nutrients. And this is important because as these cells change, as they get pushed farther away from the basement, or the, the stratum basale, the, the, the basement strata here, they, as these cells change, that's what creates that physical and waterproof, you know, that physical barrier, that, that barrier that prevents pathogens from getting in, and the waterproofing barrier for ourselves as well. Okay, so keep that in mind. But, you know, keratinocytes are not the only type of cell that you're going to find within, um, 
within the epidermis, they're just, again, the most abundant, all right? And as mentioned before, the stratum basale is the lowest the lowest strata, the lowest part, okay? And as I mentioned before, this is also the most, not only the most active part of the epidermis, but also the most diverse in terms of cell population, all right? Within the stratum basale, there are, you know, keratinocytes, Okay, there are stem cells. There's what are called Merkel cells, sensory receptors, and there are melanocytes. Okay, melanocytes, you know, you guys have all heard of melanin. Melanin is the pigment that's in your skin, and I'm going to talk about skin coloration in a little while. Okay, so again, this is, the, and it makes sense that this is the most diverse and also active area of the epidermis because, as I just mentioned, this is the strata or layer of the epidermis that's closest to the basement membrane, closest to the source of nutrients. So, as a result, the most activity is in the epidermis is going to take place here. You know, mainly, you know, the most cell division, you know, the excretion, you know, pr excretion, yeah, production and secretion of melanin and so on. All right, so that's something to keep in mind, the stratum basale. Now, as these keratinocytes divide, okay, as these keratinocytes divide, they're going to, you know, form the next layer, which is called the stratum spinosum. Okay, and all the stratum spinosum is, it's just the combination of keratinocytes and some phagocytes that we are going to call dendritic cells. Or if you're going into histology, longer Hans. Okay, so basically what these are, these are macrophages that are stored within the skin. And remember, uh, you know, those of you who, you know, if you're looking at, if you're watching this video as a review session, you know that there are cells in the blood called monocytes. Okay, which are essentially phagocytes that uh, macrophages that migrate from bone marrow into the bloodstream, and these cells are more than likely going to migrate into another tissue somewhere. Okay, and then these so these cells migrated from bone marrow into the skin itself, and then what they do, then you know, a monocyte looks about like this. You know, they're white blood cell with a big horseshoe-shaped nucleus. And then once they get into a particular environment, then they adapt to that environment, and then that's what the phagocytes do here. And, you know, these phagocytes, you know what phagocytes are important for. These are important for immunity. You know, if, uh, if you get a cut in the skin and bacteria start to get in, these will help clean up those bacteria. If, you know, when you get a cut in the skin, these cells become damaged and you need to, you know, clean up the debris before you can start the healing process. Hence, the you know, the importance of the phagocytes. All right. Now, what you'll notice, though, is that these cells do look a little different as they're working their way up, as they're expanding their way up into the, um, the upper portions of the epidermis, and that's because they're getting farther away from their basement membrane. Okay. And then next, what you're going to see is what's called the stratum granulosum. Okay, the stratum granulosum, which isn't that thick. It's only about three to five layers thick worth of cells. But what you're going to start to see is notice how these cells are becoming more densely. It looks like they're, they're, the material inside is starting to condense a lot more. What you're seeing is the beginning of the formation of keratin. Okay, there are certain, you know, the, 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 the cytoskeletal proteins along with other molecules and proteins within the cell are starting to condense, and you're forming, you're forming keratin. Okay. Um, also, there is a waterproof. Uh, there's also this is where we start to develop a waterproof secretion. All right, that is that is basically excreted from the cells. Now, as we create this waterproof secretion, so basically, what we're saying here, no water is able to get up to the upper layer called the stratum corneum. Okay, the upper strata, which is you also notice is a rather thick part of the epidermis. So if this, if we waterproof this, that means there will be no nutrients getting up into this layer of tissue, and as a result, these cells are dead. Okay, those cells are dead. All right, 
And basically, when you look at these cells, the nucleus is gone, and the organelles are broken down. But what you do have a lot of is you have a lot of keratin packed tightly within these cells. And these cells are just packed tightly together. And, you know, there are also tight junctions in here that are keeping these cells packed tightly together. You know, creating that physical barrier and that water, and then you've got this waterproof membrane on the underside of it. Okay, and in areas of, of of the thicker skin of the body, there is an there's there is an area in between the granulosum and the corneum called the stratum lucidum. Okay, called the stratum lucidum, but that's a hard area to stain. And like a, you know, in, in from a histology perspective, and it's um, like I said, only found in areas where there's really thick skin. And basically, the cells are going to look fairly similar to the stratum corneum. You know, there will be no nucleus because it will be broken down. The organelles will be broken down and dead. Okay, it's just the cells in the corneum are probably just going to have more, you know, matured or developed keratin within them. And then what's eventually going to happen, and remember, these cells on the, on the, on the base layer are still going to continue to divide. And old cells are going to continue to get pushed, pushed up and up and up. What will eventually happen are these older dead cells will exfoliate or slough off, and then, you know, this is just a nice, long, continuous process that it happens throughout our entire life, all right? And, um, you know, so skin, you know, and skin is a very, you know, the epidermis is a very metabolically active area. I'd say about every two weeks, you know, the, you know, the, it takes about two weeks for these base layer of cells to get to the point where they're completely turned over. So about every couple of weeks, you've got brand new keratin, brand new keratinocytes within the epidermis. You essentially have a brand new epidermis. All right. And that's also important to understand, you know, because when people develop cancer in the skin, that's not something to exactly be taken lightly. Okay, you know, skin cancer, you know, remember we've, we've talked about cancer a little bit before that, you know, there are some forms of skin cancer that are less harmful than others, but, but you know, for example, the worst form of cancer is a malignant melanoma, all right, you know, these essentially, I probably should be writing this with a black mark and not the blue talking about this, but, um, but you know, this is, this is a type of cancer that originates from cells, you know, especially melanocytes that are very, very active cells. And as a result, you know, coming from a high turnover tissue like this, this is a type of cancer that's going to be very, you know, more often than not, it's going to be very aggressive and spread and grow quickly. That's why this needs to be treated and taken care of properly. All right. And I'll, I'll talk more about items like this when I make some more pathology videos in the future. Okay. So essentially, this is the life cycle of a keratinocyte, how the cells go from, you know, you know, beginning to end, and how essentially we create this physical barrier, the number one feature that I mentioned before, um, with our skin. Now, the dermis of our skin is the, you know, again, the thickest part of our skin, and it can range from about 0.6 millimeters in thickness to about 3 millimeters in thickness, depending on what area of the body you're talking about, you know, your arms, your forehead, your hands, or whatnot. Okay, but you can do the math here. I mean, where do you think the skin's going to be thicker? Obviously, you're going to have a thicker dermis, you know, in your hands, in your feet, where you're constantly using them more. All right. Now, if we take a look, now, if we take a, if we kind of break, you know, take a look at the dermis, you can see that there are some, you know, specialized structures within here. So, for example, here we have a hair. This is, uh, you know, the root and bulb of the hair. All right, and notice how, you know, there are these capillary networks within here. And then there are, come on, move. Okay, you can see here, this is what's called a pylorector muscle. Pylo means, you know, P-I-L-O means hair. All right, you know, again, here are, gosh dang it, here are some sensory receptors. You can see that there are these glands that form around the hairs. There are nerves. Now, in order to control these muscles, you know, nerves need to stimulate them to contract. You know, here's another, here's a sweat gland. So you can see all the various examples of, of items that are within the dermis itself. So now, basically, you should be asking yourself, what kind of tissue is the dermis comprised of? All right. And basically, two types of tissues, areolar and reticular. All right. I'd say about the I'd say about the upper 20% of the dermis is areolar connective tissue. And then the lower 80% of skin is reticular connective tissue. 
All right. And so basically remember that areolar connective tissue is a lot more thin. All right. It's a lot more thin of a tissue. And, um, and you know, there, you can form a lot of dense networks of capillaries and small, you know, vessel networks within this. And then, the, it, to, you know, which is important for supplying, you know, the epidermis with blood. And then when you look down here in the, in the you know, his, uh, in the lower aspect of the epidermis where the reticular fibers are located. Okay, remember reticular connective tissue is made of very, you know, thick, short, branched collagen fibers. Okay, now that's important because those collagen fibers, again, are going to be thick. All right, so that gives skin, you know, the dermis a lot of resiliency and strength. You know, for example, this is important for, you know, you know if you're going to make an incision into here, or a person's going to get cut, these thick, strong collagen fibers could play, could be the difference between, you know, are you going to get cut all the way through or is it only going to go down, you know, only a little bit into this layer of tissue and so on. Okay. Or we can, or there are these friction ridges that can be created by the fibers that are in here. And it's important, uh, you know, from surgical perspectives and how you cut around the ridges that are created by these, by these uh, reticular fibers and so on in terms of healing. All right. And we'll learn, you'll learn more about that when we talk about inflammation and so on. Okay. So that's essentially the dermis, you know, the, the, basically the area that's comprised of the connective tissue proper, irregular and reticular connective tissue that houses the various glands, muscles, hairs and nerve cells and all the blood vessels that supply the skin. All right. And then the, um, whoops. And then the lowest portion of the skin, we've already talked about the hypodermis, the subcutaneous fat, again, is important for energy storage. And then there are, you know, large blood vessels in here as well. And then there's also a type of tissue called superficial fascia that essentially anchors the skin and fat to the underlying tissues, i.e. the muscle that's right underneath the skin. And basically, you know, because the skin and these muscles are kind of stuck together, all right, you know, for example, if you contract a facial muscle, you know, that muscle can pull on the skin, and then as that skin manipulates, that cre you create a facial expression. Or you can see if you wriggle your fingers around, you can see your extensor muscles and your forearm wriggle around and so on. All right. So, lo so those are the, the various tissue layers of the skin. Now let's talk about, a little bit about skin coloration. Okay, there are three major components that play a role in skin coloration. Melanin, okay, essentially this is about the color of melanin, black. Okay, melanin is a black pigment that is produced and secreted by melanocytes in the epidermis. Okay, and essentially what these melanocytes do is they is they secrete these you know via exocytosis they secrete melanin which kind of condenses together and forms these melanosomes. Okay, and then these melanosomes migrate into the epidermis and then they'll eventually get broken down and they just continue to increase the secretion of these you know based on our needs. All right, so um, so that's where the dark aspect of the skin comes from. And so for example. Melanin is important because, you know, what this does is this is a protein or a pigment that is used to absorb light. Okay, absorb light. So what's important about absorbing the light, or I should say light, I should say ultraviolet energy, is that, you know, remember, ultraviolet energy emitted from the sun could potentially do, you know, harm to our skin, all right? So if this pig, so what this pigment does is it absorbs the energy from that and prevents cellular damage within the epidermis. Now that's important because, you know, if the cells in the epidermis become damaged, they can grow out of control and then, you know, mutate and then form into cancer cells, which you know is bad, all right? And then, you know, and then, and then it's easy to tell, you know, if a, you know what part of the world a person comes from by how light or dark their skin is. People who are black, you know, people who are, you know, have a really, you know, dark complexion come from areas of the world where they have the highest exposure to sunlight, essentially around from around the equator. Okay, and that's important. They're, they have adapted to produce a lot more melanin to protect themselves from that constant bombardment of sunlight. Okay, whereas, you know, me, I'm of Irish descent, and, you know, I mean, in the UK, they see that, they, you know, the sun just isn't out as often, or if you're of Scandinavian descent, you know, that those, that people from that part of the world tend to be more pale in complexion. They don't see as much sunlight, so why should they, you know, so why physiologically waste energy producing a pigment that you don't need? 
Okay, not saying that you don't need it, but you just don't need as much as a person from around the equator. Okay. And then carotene is essentially kind of a yellowish, yellowish, or orange um, type of a pigment that can be found in skin. And that's what, uh, you know, kind of gives skin kind of its yellowish tinge to it. Or, you know, they, so, so for example, if you look at a person who's a Caucasian, you know, they're not pure white because they've got a little bit of melanin in their skin. Then you throw a little bit of that, um, you throw a little bit of that, uh, you know, this carotene in there, and you kind of have almost this, this peach-looking color to it, okay? And, uh, I mean, there are some people that do have very, very whitish, you know, complex skin, but obviously not, you know, not every Caucasian looks exactly like that, all right? And then hemoglobin, essentially, that's where the red tinge comes from. We just mentioned before that the that the blood, that the skin can hold a lot of blood. Okay, and hemoglobin um, is the pigments on red blood cells or erythrocytes that give them their red color. So, uh, so basically, as you accumulate hemoglobin within the skin, that gives you know the red tinge, and you know you can increase and decrease the amount of blood flow to the skin. For example, I don't know if you're if you do something embarrassing in public and all of a sudden your face turns beet red or um, if you have a coach yelling at you and the coach is bald and you see their whole head to hit his or, you know, you know, I was going to say his or her, but it's usually old bald guys that are yelling at you at sports. Um, you know, their whole head is turning red. They're increasing blood flow to the skin. Okay, and that's what makes skin turn red. Okay, now this is important to pay attention to because, you know, there are abnormal skin colorations that can occur with people. For example, um, you know, uh, if you look at what's called erythroderma, okay, basically your skin becomes increasingly red. Again, that could happen just because you're embarrassed or if there's some damage to the skin. If you've ever had a first degree burn or a sunburn, your skin became red because you're increasing blood flow to that skin because you want to, to that area of skin so you can heal. You know, it's part of the healing process is inflammation increasing blood flow to an area. Okay, if a person's skin darkens, okay, you know, for example, if you're a Caucasian and you go out um, tanning, what you're doing is, is you're essentially damaging your skin by bombarding it with ultraviolet sunlight, and then your skin is adapting by producing more melanocytes and producing more melanin. So as you increase your melanin output, then your skin is going to take on that darker complexion, hence the tan. Okay, now what's going to happen if you just develop a little, you know, an elevated lump on your skin and develop a mole? Okay, that's an aggregation of melanocytes. And if you already have a mole or if one pops out of nowhere, and if you already have a mole and it gets bigger, okay, that should throw up a flag. Your skin should not just, you know, you shouldn't see these little black areas of skin popping out of nowhere and they shouldn't be growing. Okay, so go get that looked at. You know, some people's skin can turn yellow. All right, you know, yellow as a result of, you know, jaundice. Okay, that's essentially when the liver fails, and then you're pumping out a yellowish pigment called bilirubin into the bloodstream, and then that circulates into the skin, and then, you know, the sclera, the white of the eyes and the skin, take on a yellow hue. And then, basically, you know, you can see how a person is progressing through liver, liver failure by how yellow they are and how much more yellow they become after you first notice they're jaundiced. Okay, so, you know, that's the nice thing about skin is that it's an organ that you can see with your own two eyes. So when there are changes with the skin, one of the biggest things you need to look for is discoloration with the skin. And the colors can tell you a lot. Or, for example, uh, I forgot to mention this, cyanosis. You know, you see this when people become hypoxic or, or de deprived of oxygen. All right, you know, as they get deprived of oxygen, you know, your blood becomes less saturated with oxygen. You're going to see that in the skin, and especially in the areas of the skin that are highly vascular, like the lips and the nail beds. Okay, there's a reason why your lips are pink and your and your and your or more pinkish red, and your nail beds are pink because there's a lot of you know a lot of capillaries in those areas. So if your blood, if your oxygen saturation goes down. Okay, it's going to turn more blue, and then that's a good way to tell if a person is choking or if they've got emphysema or whatever is going on with them. All right, um, or a very common word you're going to run into is pallor, pallor, pale. Okay, pale. You know, it just it looks like all the blood was just let out of their skin. Okay, due to you know stress and emotional response. Um, 
you know, heart issue, whatever it may be. All right, so you get the picture here. The nice thing about skin is that it can tell you a lot about what's going on with the person. Look for color changes that can occur. Okay, that's a very, very good clinical tool to keep in the back of your mind. Okay. Now, when it, another, another ma major functional part of skin are the glands that are found within skin. All right, and essentially, as I mentioned earlier, that the glands, all they are, they're just involutions. Um, they're involutions of the epidermis down into the dermis. All right, and um, I'm not really going to talk a lot about nails in this presentation. I'm going to spend most of this last part on the various glands and just a little bit about hair. All right, so let's, well, that no, let's just get into it. So sweat glands, there's a couple different types of sweat glands. Um, you know, depending on what book you read, you know, the book we use, Mary Van Hoen, uh, calls these particular glands eccrine glands. <coughs> you know, I've seen most of the books call them marocrine sweat glands. Okay, essentially, these are, these are sweat glands that are found, you know, within the dermis. And, you know, again, they're just inward folds of the epidermis. And what they are, they're these glands that have these long tubes. And then you see it looks like, uh, looks like this big coil ball down in the dermis. So essentially, and then there's, you know, then there's going to be some, you know, capillary networks right around this gland. Okay, because you have to remember that sweat essentially is, um, you know, I mean, where does the water from sweat come from? That comes from the plasma of your blood. Okay, you know, we if we need to cool our body down and we need to get rid of heat and we need to sweat, we're going to increase, you know, we're going to we're going to get rid of plasma, and that's why when if a person does not hydrate properly and they go out and exercise, they're going to get, de you know, they're going to dehydrate and pass out or have some more severe complications because if you're sweating profusely and you're not getting that water back in your system, your blood volume is going to significantly drop. And then it'll drop your blood pressure. It's going to mess up uh, your electrolyte levels. It's just going to create a mess. So make sure if you're going to be physically active and exercise or do yard work outside, you hydrate properly. All right. So these are the most abundant gland, uh, you know, you're going to find within the skin. And, um, and, you know, again, their major role is thermoregulation. You know, so like I said, if we need to cool ourselves, we will, um, we will essentially just increase the water output out of, you know, from our blood into these glands, and then we'll secrete it onto our skin. And then what will happen is that that sweat will then, you know, either evaporate off, will wipe it off, whatever, whatever. But it's important that that water not only gets onto the surface of our skin, but off of our skin. Because if you're exercising on a highly humid day, okay, and a day, you know, where it's 98, you know, 90%, 100% humidity, that can be kind of dangerous, especially if you're not used, uh, accustomed to that kind of environment. Because when the air is fully saturated with water, it's hard for this sweat to evaporate off of your skin. So then what you wind up with is all, you have all this water just accumulating on the surface of your skin, and then the heat is obviously within that water. It'd be like basically wrapping yourself in a wet heating blanket, and you could overheat. So make sure that if you're, if you're not that experienced, you you know, the, in, in terms of, you know, running or working out outside, you plan your workouts accordingly, you know, either, you know, in the morning or at night when it's, when it's more cool. Okay. So that's essentially what these glands are used for. And then apocrine glands are essentially, there aren't nearly as many of these glands. There's only a few thousand of these, um, you know, within the skin, but these are essentially highly, as mentioned here, highly concentrated in the pubic and the axillary areas. Now, these are essentially merocrine glands. They're, they're more or less the exact same type of gland with one difference is that these also secrete uh, lipids. Okay, lipids and some proteins. Okay, and these glands are, are usually inactive until around puberty they're not as active okay and then once puberty rolls around then um then these glands you know like sebaceous glands become more active and then their secretions will increase now like i said they're essentially they, they produce the same kind of um you know material that at that the, the american glands that we just talked the acrine glands we just talked about earlier produce except the differences are these fats and proteins and then this is where um you know body odor can come from at times because you know if you're if you're increasing the secretory activity out of these particular glands you got to remember as i mentioned earlier in the presentation there's a lot of bacteria with you know on our skin 
okay, fats and proteins, that's a good food source for them to chomp on. And then as they, as they consume these um, fats and proteins, then they'll emit gases, you know, like any other metabolically active organism, and then that will um, create a smell. You know, that's why it's important to, you know, after, you know, stress or whatnot to shower. Now, the exact functions of these glands are not well understood. Um, I don't know. It's the best I can give you. You know, we have them, but their purpose is still yet to be determined. I guess I'll say that. And then sebaceous glands are um, another widely distributed type of gland in the body. And sebaceous glands are created by, you know, you, you, you should always think you find sebaceous glands by hairs, okay? And sebaceous glands are, again, like most other exocrine glands, they're involutions of the, or at least the exocrine glands in the skin, they're involutions of the epidermis, okay? And then they produce, um, you know, the cells in these, active in these glands produce an oily secretion called sebum okay and then the ducts of these glands open to the hairs and then this oily secretion travels onto the hairs in the surface of the skin all right and the importance of this is it essentially softens and moistens the skin and the hair which is very which is especially important if you live in more dry areas or if there's a low hum if there's low humidity in the air all right this will keep the skin from drying and cracking and the hairs from becoming brittle and 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 from so on okay um and these glands are typically inactive until puberty rolls around. You know, the androgens, i.e. the sex hormones of the body, are what activate these glands. And um, a little bit of clinical application to this. Once in a while, some people may uh, have be in a situation where bacteria work their way into the ducts of this gland. All right, and these bacteria work their way into the ducts of the gland, and then all of a sudden you have an obstruction of this, you have an obstruction of this this duct, and then as this as that sebum accumulates, you know that'll make the gland swell, and then you'll notice the swelling on the skin. All right, and then if it you know it, as it accumulates, that's what's called a whitehead. Okay, if this sebum starts to oxidize and get broken down, and then it'll take on a more blackish color, then that's what you call a blackhead. All right, or if the bacteria work their way down into the gland itself and infect the gland, that's essentially acne. Okay, because you guys have all seen, you know, acne before. It looks like, you know, a zit. Looks like it, you know, it looks like a little white head. You know, the very end is white, and then you see the inflammation. You know, it looks very red, and this, and the gland is bulged out. Okay, and you know, wherever there's infection, there's going to be inflammation. You know, should you pop these things? Nah, leave them be. I mean, they're annoying, and they, you know, they may look goofy on you, but just leave them be. You know, your immune system will work it out. Unless the sebaceous cyst grows so large and so uncomfortable, you have to go in and have a have a specialist, you know, drain the drain the gland for you, but don't do that on your own. Let's let a specialist do that because if you don't do it right and you know you start cutting into the cyst and you don't, you know, do some basic infection control or, or this or don't do this in a sterile fashion, you know, you, you're just gonna open the floodgates for more bacteria to get in there and create a worse infection. Okay. So make sure that again let a specialist deal with this. So those are sebaceous glands and then here are some images of sebaceous glands. So here, I like this picture. I really like this picture here. So here you can see the hair. All right, and then here, this again is an involution of the um, of the uh, the epidermis, and then these are the the active cells within this gland. And you know, as you saw in the previous slide, you know, this is a holocrine gland. And remember, a holocrine gland are essentially when the cells themselves break apart, and then the secretions are, you know, and and other materials within the cell are tra travel out of the duct of that gland. That's a you know holocrine secretion. Okay, and then here's another image of. So you can see here, this would be this would be a transverse section horizontal section so you can see that this is a hair so this would be like if i took a hair and i sliced it like this and i'm looking down like so okay and then you can see the glands right alongside the hair okay and then again their secretions are secreted out of ducts and then they travel up the hair and then out onto the surface of the skin it's kind of neat 
Okay, so those are the glands of skin. And then hair, you know, hair essentially is, um, you know, d the function depends on where you find it. You know, the hair on your head is the thermal insulator, you know, basically because it's, it's thick enough to where it can hold in heat. Um, you know, whereas the hair on your, on your, you know, distributed on your skin, you know, like your hair, your, the, your hair, your arms and your legs, that's more for sensation. Okay. It's just not thick enough to hold in heat. Okay. But, uh, as we, okay. Now, normally that in, the, in this image here, let's take a look at this for a second. There are nerves that are, you know, usually coiled around the shafts of hair here. And basically, so here's the sensory aspect of this. So let's say you've got a bug crawling along your skin. All right. As that bug is crawling along and it bends that hair, then that's going to activate these, you know, these, these receptors on the, on the hair. And then you'll know that you'll have a little creepy crawly crawling on your skin. All right. So that's what the, the body hair uh, is primarily for is for the sensory aspect. And then the hair on your head is more the insulator. All right. Um, Uh, and then you know where hair is distributed, you know, except for on the palms, soles, lips, nipples, and so on. Um, all right, and then, so as we, oops, as we take a look here at this hair, we can, at this image of the hair, ah, let's talk about this here for a second. You can see right here, this is a muscle called a pilo erector muscle, okay? The importance of a piloerector muscle is when this muscle contracts, is it makes your hair, so let's say here's your skin, all right, your hair is normally kind of tilted like so. If this muscle contracts, that'll make the hair stand upright. You know, pilo, meaning hair, erect, you know, meaning upright. Okay, so if this hair is upright, then... No, so why do we do this? Okay, well, for starters, do you think you got con? Do you think it, do, you, do you think you have conscious control over this? Can you sit there and say goosebumps come? Mm. There are no goosebumps. No. Okay, so what type of muscle is this? So that eliminates skeletal muscle because that's the only one you have voluntary control over. Well, obviously it's not cardiac muscle because that's only found in one area of the body. So process of elimination would mean that this is smooth muscle. Okay, smooth muscle. Okay. So essentially what this does, now we contract these muscles when we're in a situation of stress. Okay, we're in a situation of stress. All right, so let's think about this for a sec. You ever been in a situation where you're scared? You know, let's say you're walking through the woods. I mean, I grew up in a small town. I spent a lot of time out in the woods and... You ever just get that feeling like an animal's watching you, or you see a bear, or you see a wild animal you know that uh, is, is big enough to do some harm to you? Um, you know, you get scared, and it feels like the hairs on the back of your neck go boink, stand right up. That's a stressful situation. So why when you're cold then? You know, because I always get asked this question, you know, how can they stand up when you're cold? Well, remember, cold is also stress on the physiology. Okay, as you're stressed out, okay, you're going to you're going to activate the, you know, the right divisions of your nervous system that are going to make these muscles contract and then make your hairs go doink, stand up. Okay, now let's think about an animal, for example. I, I have, a, you know, besides us, you know, I have a cat, okay, and, and her name is Gizmo. All right, and let's say I decided to get a new cat. And, um, and let's say the new cat and Gizmo just did not get along. I don't know if, if, if any of you ever have a, any of you have cats or dogs. Um, you know, if you guys, you guys ever seen a cat or a dog get mad, you know, what do they do? You know, the cat will arch their back. They'll stick their tail up. Their ears will pop up. Okay. And then the hairs on their back will be upright. What are they trying to do here? They're trying to make themselves look bigger. You know, they're trying to make themselves look bigger. So when you're when you're threatened, when you're stressed, this is a good way. You know, this is just, this is a way to make yourself look bigger, more intimidating, to try to ward off whatever the the stress or the threatening stimulus is to you.
Okay, so that's the importance of a pile of importance of a pile of erector muscle. All right. Now, when we look at hair, okay, the hair basically what you've got is you've got um, you know the bulb, the root, and the shaft, and so on of a hair. Um, now you'll notice that down here. Okay, so down in this bulb, there would normally be blood vessels here. And then you've got the root of the hair. And then what you don't see, so this would be the bulb. This would be the root. And then this would be the shaft. Okay. So the bulb is essentially where all the blood vessels are located. And then, you know, very similar to the epidermis, the cells within the cells within the hair are very mitotically active. And they're going to blunk. They're going to be pushed upward. Okay. And then now basically the part of the hair, the root that's underneath the skin, the cells are still alive within here and then by the time the cells penetrate the skin and you actually see them sticking out of the skin yeah ie the shaft of the hair those cells are dead okay those cells are essentially dead so again as you take a look in this picture you can see you know these are you know all of this is still alive all right and that's why for example if someone has uh I don't know if you guys ever know anyone with an eating disorder or so on. You notice their hair growth is not that good or doesn't even, their hair starts to fall out because they're so deprived of nutrients that they, um, you know, if you're not able to nourish this highly, you know, mitotically metabolic um, process here, these cells aren't going to grow like they normally should. Okay. And then as a result, you know, you know hair could start falling out. All right. Or if a person is diabetic and these small capillaries are going to get damaged as a result of this, you'll notice that, the, you know, and, the, and then all of a sudden these, you know, the hair can't get, can't get blood. Okay. They're not going to grow. And that's something to pay attention to because, you know, what are the, because something to keep in mind about complications with diabetes okay, is that the smallest vessels of the body, you know, the microcirculation are the greatest, the, the vessels that are the most greatly affected by this, okay, and, you know, the, the capillaries, you know, the vessels in the, the eye, the kidneys, and the, and the appendages of your skin are going to be the most greatly affected by the, you know, by the complications and changes that occur in a person's blood via diabetes, the high blood pressure, the thicker blood, and so on. Okay, those small vessels just can't handle that stress, and some people just don't pay well attention to this, and and you know some people don't figure out they've got diabetes, like for example type two diabetes, until they have to go in and get a limb amputated. Okay, because one thing to look out for is the the small vessels in the skin that supply nerves and hair are going to become damaged, and then they'll start to slightly go numb, and then all of a sudden hair will stop stop growing. There won't even be hair down there anymore, and then that's when that's a terrible warning sign that you should go to the doctor. Okay. So that is you know more or less the the major high points of skin that you need to pay attention to. Um, when, you know, studying this, at, when studying this organ system, um, you know, as usual, if you guys have any questions, feel free to contact me and uh, keep uh, studying hard.